So there's been this whole movement in recent years of a retrieval of what we sometimes call classical theology, which is a way of thinking about God that's pretty much universal. I would say basically, maybe there's some exceptions here or there, universal throughout all of Christian history until the 20th century. Among the church fathers, East and West, medieval doctors, early modern Christianity, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, it's pretty much everywhere. Uh, but then there's been this wave of criticism of uh, this whole sort of set of instincts for construing God and the God-world relation uh, in, in more recent times, especially in philosophical circles. So if you think of this interesting book right here, Does God Have a Nature by Alvin Plantinga, the great philosopher. I always hesitate to criticize anything he's done because I have such great respect for Alvin Plantinga, wonderful philosopher. But he uh, that came out of a set of lectures he did at Marquette University in 1980, published by Marquette University Press. That was a very influential book. Uh, and since then, and also a little bit before then, there's been this stream of criticism of divine simplicity, which we're going to cover in this video. That's one component of classical theism. Probably the most controversial, maybe up there with divine impassibility, which is the idea that God is not subject to passions. Another component of classical theism is divine aseity, which means that God is not uh, derived from anything external to himself. He's entirely from himself in that he is and in everything that he is. Uh, what he is. I'm, I, I think I'm going to do a, another video down the pipeline a little bit on divine aseity um, because I've just been doing a book chapter on that and that's been fascinating. Um, and then there's other aspects of it too. Divine immutability, that God does not change. Divine eternity. And this has all gotten very controversial. I mean, in some respects, the debate about divine simplicity, for example, especially in evangelical circles, uh, there's just a, I, I think I could put it this strong, the instincts by which we sort of navigate on a question like that or divine impassibility are pretty much tilting in the opposite direction today for the average evangelical, at least in my context in the United States, than they were the entire stream of church history. Um, and you've got pretty significant philosophers, not just uh, planting up people like William Lane Craig, who totally reject things like divine simplicity. Uh, and there's a, a, a some pretty heavy hitting criticism lifted against divine simplicity. It's said that God that divine simplicity is is against scripture. It makes God unknowable. It's against God's freedom. It's against the incarnation. It's against the Trinity. I think one of the biggest criticisms that we'll get into today is that divine simplicity is just simply incoherent. It just makes no sense. <laughs> and we'll talk about that, why people feel that way. But in some respects, this issue is kind of a fault line between theologians and philosophers. And I want to say something about that. I am so convinced that it's useful in on those kinds of issues to proceed with great caution and humility. Okay, the theologians, people who have training in historical theology like me, we need to listen very, very carefully to the philosophers. We can learn something from them. The philosophers, may I say, we need to listen very carefully to the theologians, okay? Sometimes there are sensitivities in the other discipline that we aren't quite up to speed on and we can benefit from the other discipline. I'm really convinced of that. I've thought many times, I talk to my wife Esther about this all the time, if there is some way, maybe if my YouTube channel blows up, <laughs> I can afford, I would love to go back and get a second PhD in philosophy. I, philosophy is my first love, and I, but I, I recognize I want to keep growing in that area. So I've been reading a lot. But for now, until you all become patrons, <laughs> I will have to just be reading on my own. But divine simplicity is one of those areas where, if, if I could say, it seems like philosophers tend to be more critical as a tendency. Um, and theologians and those who are coming at it from a historical theology perspective tend to be more sympathetic. And that's where I'm coming from. I want to give a defense of divine simplicity. But just seeing that is helpful, seeing a little bit of the context, and just recognizing this is a pretty much universal aspect of our heritage. So we need to be really careful before we jettison something like this. Rejecting divine simplicity, if you lived uh, in the patristic era or something like that, or even among like the reformed scholastics, people like that, 
this would not be seen as like a minor blemish in your theology. This would be seen as undermining the whole of the way you're even conceiving who and what God is. I think I need to put it that strongly. So that's why I'm so burdened and I've become so passionately convinced that this matters and that we should think about this, even though it's very abstruse and heady. So if you've got aspirin, <laughs> have them handy in case the headache comes, because this is a really um, abstract kind of idea. But I, I'll try to walk us through this. I've done so much... Um, of a deep dive myself. Uh, this is where I'll never forget spring quarter 2013 in the Fuller Seminary Library. I just went straight into the, the primary sources, not just Christian, but also Jewish and Muslim and Neoplatonist, and just comb through just trying to understand this doctrine. And uh, that is really when my love for theological retrieval began. And I began to see just how much value there is in learning from the wisdom of the past. And especially in being, if I could put it like this, trying to be humbled in our instincts and how different and strange they are in the modern era compared to kind of by measuring our, our thought by the, by, the, by the past. And I think this is this. So this whole issue, divine simplicity, is really important for how theologians and philosophers talk to each other, for how we function historically in relation to the past. And I'm really burdened for evangelicals to give it more focus. So um, I've got some notes planned out, but I'm just going to talk. I've been thinking about this, and, and hopefully it'll come out coherent. I want to say five things in this video. First, we'll ask, what is divine simplicity? Second, why is it important? Third, uh, how does it make sense? Fourth, what about the Trinity? How can a simple God be triune? And fifth, I'll respond to some objections. And I try not to talk too much about my own books, but all of this is coming out of an article I wrote uh, in 2013, you could find it in the International Journal of Systematic Theology, but it's been refurbished a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit, and then republished in my book, Theological Retrieval for Evangelicals, in chapter 5 of this book. So, um, if, because I'm going to glide through it as fast as I can, try to be succinct and clear, uh, and so if you're wanting to know what are the sources for these quotes, can I, how do I go a little deeper? He said something quickly. I want to explore that more, especially on the Trinitarianism piece. There's a lot more there if you want to check that out. So uh, I think that's all I have to say, except if you'd like this video, if you appreciate it, I always appreciate that. And thanks for the comments and those of you who are patrons. Uh, I just had two lengthy phone calls this week with patrons. It's so fun getting to make new friends on YouTube. It's just amazing the kind of connections. People find a video, you realize, wow, I'm not the only one who thinks about this, you know. So um, if you're willing to support my channel in, in any of those ways, it always means a lot. So thanks for that. All right, let's dive right in. So first, what is divine simplicity? Dictionary definition first, and then let's comb through historically. I think for each of these, because I've spent so much time wading through these historical resources, I think this will be a helpful angle of approach for these different questions is to come at it from a historical angle. So divine simplicity does not mean that God isn't complicated. It means that God is not composite. Uh, that is to say, God is not made up of parts, either spatial or temporal parts, or uh, metaphysical or ontological parts. It, you can't break down God into some kind of prior ontological elements. God is absolutely simple. Uh, now, just to get into this a bit historically, this is pressed out a little differently in the East and in the West. Now, usually I'm pretty skeptical of these East versus West contrasts because usually you get into them and you realize these are pretty facile. They're not, they don't really actually, um, they're not just not accurate a lot of the time. So a lot of times people say, you know, there's the Greek speaking East, which emphasizes the threeness of God and the Latin speaking West, which emphasizes the oneness of God. Have you ever heard this? It's a common sort of construct that really doesn't bear out. And if you, you get into reading the Church Fathers, you realize that's not really true. But on this doctrine, my own deep dive into the sources has convinced me that there is a difference between the East and the West on divine simplicity and how you define that uh, in terms of how ambitious, they're not necessarily irreconcilable, but in terms of how ambitious they are, and how they're put to use. 
for a theological purpose. So in the West, you get sort of a stronger account, sometimes called the identity thesis or the identity account, in which basically, in addition to making the negative claim that there's no parts in God, there's the positive claim that God is identical to his existence and to his attributes. And that second part is where the philosophers really start to press us a bit, uh, understandably so. And they, so, for example, uh, God is not merely righteous, God is righteousness. God is not merely loving, God is love. God is identical to each of his attributes. Another way to put it, very succinctly, is to say all that is in God is God. There is nothing in God that is not identical to himself. And a shorter way to put it that I like to put it is simply to say God is what he has. Uh, this is the view that you see throughout the West in Augustine and Anselm and Aquinas and following him as well. One of the strongest e expressions of it I found is in William Ockham, which I'll put up on the screen here. He said, divine wisdom is the same as the divine essence in every way in which the divine essence is the same as itself. There's a sentence you could think about. I told you, have the aspirin ready because <laughs> this is pretty, uh, ab pretty abstruse. Uh, you could think about that sentence for a long time, and you can, we can understand why people are starting to scratch their heads and say this is incoherent. He says, similarly, for divine goodness and justice, nor is there any distinction at all, or even any non-identity there in the nature of the thing. Now, in the, in the Eastern tradition, it's a little less ambitious than that, in my opinion. You definitely have the strong den, uh, denial of any parts in God, but you don't always have this... Um, affirmation that God is identical with his attributes. And it looks to me like, generally speaking, there is, there's a, a denial of that, or at least it's pushing in the other direction. So in the Cappadocian Fathers, Basel, Caesarea, Gregory of Nyssa, um, in their context, they're, they're fighting a different battle, really. They're fighting against Eunomius, the Arian, and also they're opposing Clement of Alexandria and his negative theology, and some of the stronger... Uh, apophatic claims. Apophatic means a theology by negation, theology by negation. So you're making a positive assertion of God by means of making a negative assertion about what God isn't. And they're trying to affirm the full deity of the Son and the Spirit, and they're trying to affirm Trinitarianism while at the same time grounding the Trinity as monotheistic. And so they're using divine simplicity in that context. But those two and many others in the early theologians in the East, Didymus the Blind, for example, they don't really say God is identical to his attributes. And in fact, as that tradition goes, so like in Gregory of Nazianzus, the other Cappadocian father, in his orations, um, he's blasting away at, at the, uh, the Eunomians, but, and he regularly is saying, God, the adjectives I've found there are non-composite and undivided. So he wants to say that about God, but he never really further entails what that means exactly. And then you get to John of Damascus, kind of the summative Eastern patristic witness. And he's basically saying, he's he, again, it looks to me like he's saying with the whole essence energies distinction, God's attributes are identical with God's energies, but not with his essence. And there's uh, if you're interested in chasing this down, there's a, a very interesting book by Andrew Reddy Galwitz on these Cappadocian fathers and their little different approach to divine simplicity. So um, there's, there's differences in the East and the West. It's not obvious to me that they're necessarily necessarily irreconcilable. I'm not sure. Uh, I've, I've been a little bit less certain over the last few years of how far Basel and Gregory push their claims there. But... Um, here's the thing, everybody, and even Gregory and Basel, it, despite the pressure that's on them uh, from Eunomius and the, and the Neo-Arians, everybody is denying that there's any parts in God. So the basic commitment that gets you to be an, a proponent of divine simplicity is on the table for everybody. So let's ask why that's the case. Here's the second question. Why has this doctrine, in different contexts, uh, and, it, and in different times and places been seen to be so important. Uh, what's at stake with this? And the essential answer to that is that it's seen to protect other things that are absolutely integral 
to the nature of God, especially divine aseity and divine absoluteness. So divine aseity is the idea that God exists from himself and that everything he has is from himself. He does not derive in any way from anything external to himself. And divine absoluteness is the idea that God is not conditioned by anything external to himself. So what we're trying to avoid here is the idea that there's love and, and that's there. And then here comes God and God happens to correspond to love. So therefore we say God is loving. Um, we're trying to protect, a way to put it is we're trying to protect the Godness of God, the absolute uniqueness and transcendence of God. And you can see throughout, so let me give some more examples of how I've seen, again, coming at this from a historical angle, of why divine simplicity has been seen to be so important. And especially, here's another point of contrast with the tradition versus the contemporary philosophical approach. Not only does the contemporary philosophical approach tend to just go straight to Thomas Aquinas's account of this, and not sometimes they don't really look at, you know, so in my chapter, I put a lot of focus on John of Damascus and Anselm, because I think you just get a little different flavor with them. But a lot of the tradition only looks at Thomas, and they don't look at some of these other ways of explicating divine simplicity. But the other thing is, when you get into the historical account of this doctrine, you get a whole different set of instincts. You get a whole different set of concerns. You're drawn into a broader horizon of concern. So in the contemporary discussion, divine simplicity is often seen as just kind of a, a an academic thing, a kind of a philosophical consequence within the doctrine of God to think about. But in the witness and worship of the church, divine simplicity was absolutely essential for the church simply being the church. Uh, it was a part of the worship of the church. It was a part of the apologetics of the church. So, for example, Athenagoras, one of the early Christian apologists, when he's writing a letter to some of the Roman emperors, if you've seen the movie Gladiator, uh, you remember the emperors in that movie, Marcus Aurelius and then Commodus. You think of Joaquin Phoenix, the bad guy. Uh, those are the two emperors. It's so cool. He, ca he calls them Aurelius and Commodus, but those are the two emperors that uh, Athenagoras is writing to, and he's defending Christian theism over and against the polytheism of the day, and the way he does that is divine simplicity. For him to accept a simple, non-composite God was part and parcel with rejecting the polytheism of his day. And so, he, you know, in, in an apologetics-type context, simplicity was important to him. Uh, if you go f down the road a little bit, you get to Boethius in the 6th century. Uh, he's writing his famous, one of my favorite texts in all of historical theology, The Consolation of Philosophy. He uses divine simplicity to establish that the divine nature is beautiful and stable. I'll never forget when I read the sentence where he says that. So, again, this is like you get into divine simplicity from a historical angle, it pulls you into a, a, a bigger set of concerns. Uh, it's a fascinating thought that a simple God leads you to a more stable conception of God and a more beautiful conception of God. Another text that's been fascinating to see this in is Bonaventure, the me medieval theologian, his work of mystical theology, the journey into the mind of God, where he's sort of summoning his soul into the contemplation of God, uh, the beatific vision in heaven and the contemplation of that. And divine simplicity is huge in that book. He's drawing other doctrines like God's power, for example, out of divine simplicity. Divine simplicity really grounds the whole creator-creation relationship that is the premise of his uh, mystical approach to God. So, for example, at one point he, he says, because the divine nature is the most simple and the greatest, he's just derived divine greatness from divine simplicity, it is holy within all things and holy outside them. Hence it is the intelligible sphere whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. That last little bit there is a quote from Alan of Lille, the 12th century French theologian and poet. And I love that imagery for God's absoluteness and God's omnipresence. His, you know, the circumference is the outer rim of a circle. God's center is everywhere. His circumference is nowhere. In other words, 
It's not as though if you could find the middle part of God, then you just expand outward everywhere and God is infinite in that sense. Rather, the center of God is everywhere. And, uh, but what he's saying here, and the, I guess the, the, the thing I would draw from this quote from Bonaventure is the contemporary philosophical discussion of simplicity tends to think of divine simplicity as kind of a static doctrine that cuts us off. It slices us off from meaningful, dynamic relationship to God. And for the pre-modern tradition, it's the exact opposite. It was used to ground the creator-creation relationship. It had a more fluid and dynamic role. So elsewhere, Bonaventure says that because God is simple, he has all communicability within himself. In other words, there's this, you get this sense that because, of, because God is simple, he can be fully present to every creature in every way. As he, as Bonaventure puts, he's outside all things, but he's also inside all things. Now, whether you agree with Bonaventure or not about that, the interesting thing is that divine simplicity has this huge function for him in grounding the way we relate to God, uh, even in a work of mystical theology. So it's pretty interesting. the The big takeaway I would just say is, for the church, divine simplicity has regularly, perhaps I should say universally, until recent times been basically how you construe the creator-creation relationship. It's sort of a, a one of the vital underpinnings of that to protect that and, and to protect the, the godness of God. Okay, so let's ask the third question. How do we make sense of this? Because probably some of us are already, again, you might have the aspirin in hand already, but probably some of us already are thinking, this just seems so bizarre and so sort of incoherent. So, you know, Plantinga, for example, says things like, okay, if God is identical to his attributes, then are his attributes identical to each other? Uh, how can you have a personal God who's identical to abstract qualities like wisdom? How can you say they're the exact same thing? Totally reasonable kind of questions. But, of course, Christians thought about that. So here again, from a historical angle, let's tease out a little bit of how this idea might not be totally incoherent, how it might actually make some sense. So again, coming at it from a historical angle, let me talk about some of the influences upon the church's understanding of this doctrine. And the big idea we're going to argue for here is that they understood God to exist in a different ontological framework. So the word ontological has to do with being. God is a fundamentally different kind of being than everything else. So one of the huge influences upon the church's understanding of divine simplicity was Plotinus, who was a Neoplatonist philosopher in the third century. And to kind of cut to the chase and not go too much into the weeds here, he made a very important sort of innovation in talking about, in a Platonist conception, the one as being before being. So the word I've used is pre-ontological. And this starts to get picked up in later Neoplatonist thinkers and then in the church. So the uh, 5th and 6th century Neoplatonist philosopher, uh, Pseudo-Dionysius. This is someone that people thought was the real Dionysius, as in the guy in Acts 17 in Athens who's converted under Paul's preaching. So people took him very seriously. You can see in Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologica all the time, he's quoting Dionysius with great respect. Pseudo-Dionysius says, now the reformers don't like him. Martin Luther, not a fan. <laughs> um, but the basic idea is retained, by, even by them, that God is supra-essential. Okay? God is in a different ontological framework. He's in a category of his own. Pseudo-Dionysius calls God mind beyond mind, word beyond speech. Uh, he says he transcends existence itself. He transcends every category of existence. Uh, he says, the one cause of all things is not one of the, th the many things in the world, but actually precedes oneness and multiplicity, and indeed defines oneness and multiplicity. This is in the context of explaining how God can be one and three. So, of course, not everyone follows these Neoplatonist thinkers in everything, but this basic idea becomes very prominent as a, as a way for the church to make sense of this. So in the Eastern tradition with John of Damascus, you see it very strongly. He calls God supra-essential. He, ca he calls God at one point the supra-essential essence, the Godhead that is more than God, the beginning that is above every beginning. 
In the West, you can see it with Thomas Aquinas and the claim that God is not a genus, which is a kind of a, a philosophical, ontological category. So he says, at one point, God is not related to creatures as though belonging to a different genus, but as transcending every genus, as the principle of all genera. To put this colloquially, we could just say God doesn't fit into our categories. He's entirely in a league of his own. Um, and what this highlights for me, and if I know that's been a lot, but here's just to draw to a, a point here with this, with this third question of how this makes sense. I'll never forget being in the Fuller Seminary Library when this sentence came to me, studying these historical resources. The way I put it is this. In much of the contemporary philosophical discussion, um, God is approached as though he exists within a larger structure we call reality. Uh, in classical theology, uh, there's the, I should put these tendencies, of course, not universal. There's the tendency to approach reality as itself subsisting within the being of God. Shorter way to make the contrast, God is not within reality. Reality is within God. That's a way to derive, that's a consequence to derive from this idea that God is beyond being. Uh, in other words, God is not just a thing among other things. God simply is. And this is what divine simplicity has done for me. Again, the great value of this is to highlight the godness of God, his absolute uniqueness and transcendence. And one consequence of that is a sort of linguistic cautioning. So when we go back to Alvin Plantinga and we ask, why does Plantinga have a different set of instincts than Thomas Aquinas or the Cappadocian fathers or basically anybody pre-modern? In terms of, I'm not trying to pick on Alvin Plantinga. I love Alvin Plantinga, but he's representative of a, a, a modern approach. Um, and it's because there's, you know, so the, the claim, well, if, God's, if God is identical to his attributes, are his attributes identical to each other? Well, there's a cautioning influence upon us from these pre-modern resources saying, why would we assume that, that the divine nature sort of plays by the same rules, so to speak, as the way other creatures relate to their own attributes. Here's how Augustine puts the caution. Whatever is said of a nature unchangeable, invisible, and having life absolutely sufficient to itself, that's God, must not be measured after the custom of things visible and changeable and mortal or not self-sufficient. Here's how Anselm puts it, my favorite theological text. You do not exist in a place or time, rather all things exist in you, for nothing contains you, but you contain all things. That last sentence there is a good way of getting at the kind of ontological approach that divine simplicity opens us up to. At least that's what it's done for me. And it seems to me like a lot of these claims from the contemporary philosophers are assuming that God is on the same ontological plane as other things. They're assuming that God will relate to his attributes in the way that a creature relates to the creature's attributes. And I don't think we can assume that. Okay, number four. What about the Trinity? How, does, how do we reconcile divine simplicity with the fact that there's three persons in the Godhead? Well, a lot of the contemporary, a lot of what I'm doing in this video is trying to contrast the contemporary tendencies in philosophical approach to divine simplicity with those of the classical Christian tradition. On this one, the tendency is to think that uh, the Trinity is at odds with divine simplicity. And that's kind of an understandable instinct. It's certainly the way Muslim and Jewish philosophers and theologians thought that for them, there's polytheism, Trinitarianism is pretty close to that. And then over here on the other side, there's a simple God. And that's how they thought that Trinitarian theism is just one step removed from polytheism because of divine simplicity. So you can see Moses Maimonides, the great medieval Jewish philosopher and his and, and theologian, his book, The Guide for the per Perplexed, has a well-known treatment on divine simplicity. And uh, he, he pushes it, I mean, he, he, goes so, he goes so far as to say um, that God has no essential attributes. He doesn't even want to predicate attributes in God essential attributes in God. The Muslim philosophers don't even go that far. They go close. Avicenna, who's a Muslim philosopher, says God's attributes can only be understood as negations or privations. So this is a very apophatic approach to God, and divine simplicity is really controlling the, the approach of it.
And this and they see that as at odds with the Trinity. At one point, uh, Moses Maimonides, I'll never forget reading this sentence in his The Guide for the Perplexed. He says, the closest you can get to cognizing God, to thinking of God, is picturing whiteness. And I remember thinking, okay, if you're going to go that apophatic, why whiteness, <laughs> right? Why not a different color? Why not blackness or something like that? That seems kind of arbitrary. But here's the point that I want to make for this video. In light of these strong criticisms of the Trinity on the basis of divine simplicity from those outside the church, it's all the more striking that classical theologians didn't spend that much time trying to reconcile divine simplicity and the Trinity. There's an enormous amount of caution in, in the classical tradition about how we speak about the divine essence. The greater interest of classical theologians was to use divine simplicity to ground the Trinity as firmly monotheistic. So uh, today people often use perichoresis, the idea of mutual indwelling or interpenetration among the persons of the Godhead as a way to retain monotheism while you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three persons. That's kind of on the back foot in the tradition, I think. I don't think you really get perichoresis applied to the divine persons until John of Damascus in the seventh century. The perichoresis originally had to do with the two natures of Christ. And I think that's a useful, you know, I'm not against that idea, but that's more on the back foot. The, the tradition's primary way of dealing with this problem was divine simplicity. Here's how Basil the Great put it. He's uh, comparing the relation of God the Father and God the Son to the relationship of the emperor and the image of the emperor on a coin. And he says, how does one and one not equal two gods? Because we speak of the emperor and the emperor's image, but not two emperors. Now here's the sentence that's key. Since the divine nature is not composed of parts, union of the persons is accomplished by partaking of the whole. That sentence right there. Uh, using divine simplicity to ground the Trinity as monotheistic is a good representative sample of how the whole tradition basically goes. You see in, in the West with Thomas Aquinas, he's basically saying you can have a plurality of relations in God, but not a plurality of absolute things. A plurality of relations does not uh, import composition onto the divine essence. And Again, the interesting thing is how little time they spend trying to defend how you reconcile divine simplicity and the Trinity. To the extent that that question comes up, it's primarily by way of just a caution. So here's Basel again. He said, when the Lord taught us the doctrine of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he did not make arithmetic a part of this gift. The unapproachable one is beyond numbers, wisest sirs. Imitate the reverence shown by the Hebrews of old, to the unutterable name of God. That's, of course, the Jewish practice of not speaking the divine name. And it's sort of just a caution that he's giving there, or almost a sort of rebuke of just, again, gesturing toward divine transcendence, divine uniqueness. Um, he's, he's beyond numbers. Did you catch that language? That feels a lot like pseudo-Dionysius, right? God is in his, is his own ontological framework. So there's not even that much of a sense of a need to reconcile the Trinity and simplicity. You just put them to work. That's kind of how the, the instincts of the tradition works. Really fascinating. Now, let me respond to a couple of objections. I'm sure some people find this. I've even had people say to me, this divine simplicity makes God a little bit scary, <laughs> which I kind of understand. It leads to a, like a, dark, a darker conception of God. And then there's other concerns. One of the concerns is, is this irrational? You're saying logic doesn't apply to God? And I'd say, well, not exactly. We're not saying that God defies logic. We're saying that God defines logic as its source and therefore has a unique relationship to it. Okay? It's not that God has no relation to logic or God is illogical. It's just that God relates to logic in a way that nothing else relates to logic because he is its source, its ontological source. So God isn't just sort of an arbitrary exception to the rules. It's that he's a different kind of thing altogether. So creaturely language, creaturely numbers, remember unity and differentiation, those categories, uh, logic applies to the divine essence uniquely. This is an absolutely unique test case. This is the same way I'd respond to one of the other concerns that divine simplicity leads to divine agnosticism. 
We don't really know what God is like anymore because we make the divine essence so different and alien and, and far removed from anything else we know. So I've had people say to me, divine simplicity makes the goodness of God arbitrary. How do, when we say God is good, how do we even know what we, what we mean by that? Because his goodness is so different from our goodness. And again, there's a little bit of nuance here. We want to say not that God's goodness has no relation to our goodness, but it has an absolutely unique relation to our conception of goodness because he's a source of goodness. So we can call God good, but we just recognize he's not good in the exact same way that other things are good. If you're familiar with this language, uh, basically what we're saying is that our language doesn't map on to God in a univocal way, sort of a one-to-one -one correspondence. But that doesn't mean on the other extreme it uh, has a has an equivocal relationship with God. What we're talking about is an analogical relationship with God. And what that ultimately leaves us with is not an obliterated knowledge of God, but a chastened, humbled knowledge of God. And that, I'll close the video now, that is what I ultimately take from divine simplicity at a practical level. It's a reminder of the godness of God. It humbles us to the dust under the absolute transcendence and lordship of God. He is like nothing else. Here's a quote from a novel of C.S. Lewis that I quote, I conclude my chapter with, that captures something of the import and the caution that I think divine simplicity impresses upon us. There's a priest speaking in this book, and he says, I, king, have dealt with the gods for three generations of men, and I know they dazzle our eyes and flow in and out of one another like eddies on a river. And nothing that is said clearly can be said truly about them. Holy places are dark places. It is life and strength, not knowledge and words, that we get in them. Holy wisdom is not clear and thin like water, but thick and dark like blood. What I say in the chapter is obviously the content of this priest theology is, is uh, troubling. But the, what I draw from it is the willingness to uh, embrace counterintuitive ways of thinking when we're dealing with the divine essence because it's something utterly unique. And that is what I ultimately take. A, a, a way of, a, another way to get at this would be to quote Gregory of Nazianzus in his orations. He says, our starting point must be that God cannot be named. Now, I know that that can seem kind of bracing, but um, I think that there is a positive way of thinking about that that is... Uh, both biblical, rooted in the classical instincts of the church, and uh, very productive theologically. In this, in this sort of chastened, cautioned position, it leaves us as creatures relating to the Creator, because He is like nothing else that we know. And therefore, we are entirely dependent upon His revelation to understand Him and to speak of Him. That's how I, <laughs> to end it on a dramatic note, I guess, that's how I have come to see these things. I've been enormously helped by the historic witness of the church on this matter. Um, but I recognize we're in some dark waters here, and it's, uh, this is a bracing thing. So I'm curious what you think in the comments. Some of you may be defenders of uh, divine simplicity. I'm curious since I've done a lot of my own, I'm not regurgitating others' arguments, I've done a lot of my own digging in the classical resources. I'm curious kind of how this strikes you, you know. Others of you, it may be a new topic too. I'm curious how it strikes you. Hopefully, maybe at least you have some sense of what it is. Others of you may be skeptical of divine simplicity. I'm curious how that strikes you. So let me know what you think in the comments. Thanks as always for watching. Thanks for my patrons supporting my work. That means so much to me. Thanks for those of you who share and like the videos. If you watch a lot of my videos, why not subscribe? It's a great way that we can stay in contact. Nothing bad happens. You don't even, if you subscribe and hit the bell, you get a little notice. But if you just subscribe, basically, it's no difference, you know, other than that, um, now we're connected in that way. So um, anyway, thanks for uh, the, uh, all of the support and those of you who are supporting what, the work that I'm doing. I try to keep on having one video out per week, but I'm traveling a little bit this summer, so there might be one or two weeks I miss. But uh, let me know what you think in the comments, and God bless you. Thanks for watching.